you know what, I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. It looks like the number of people coming in has slowed down to uh, a slow trickle. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Baker. I'm the Executive Director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, and uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this webinar tonight, this public meeting on the I-89-2050 study, um, and uh, welcome you on behalf of not only the Regional Planning Commission, but also VTRANS and our consultant partners in this VHB. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank uh, Town Meeting TV for live streaming this and recording it. Um, this will be available as a recording uh, both through Town Meeting T TV afterward and also on the project website, envision89.com, and on the public process page. So if you want to reference this at a later date, it will be in both places. And we have about 30 minutes of presentation. Um, and so not knowing how many people we'd have participate, and it's a pretty good number, uh, we're over 60 attendees now. So we're gonna run through the presentation and then open it up for questions and comments. Um, and uh, Sean will give us, uh, from the VHB team, will give us uh, some more uh, detail on that. Um, and just to introduce the project team who's on the screen right now, just so you know uh, whose face is who, um, I'll start with the RPC staff. Elaine Churchill is a project manager. Um, yeah, you can wave and say hello. Oh, yeah, and Jason Charest uh, is the senior transportation planning engineer. Uh, thanks. And on the VHB team, uh, David Saladino, uh, the project manager, Karen Sentoff, and then also uh, Diane Meyerhoff is helping out too. And, and Sean, whose face is not visible, uh, is more on the IT team, so he's making sure this technology works all right for us tonight. So uh, welcome everyone, really thank you. And uh, Dave, can you pull up the presentation? Uh, uh, Sean has a couple uh, oh. kind of opening notes. Yeah, sure, Sean. Hello folks. Um, so when we do get to the uh, question and answer session uh, section of the uh, meeting tonight, we've got two different ways to uh, participate. Um, we're going to be using the question and answer feature of Zoom. If you are on the computer uh, or on a mobile device, um, down at the bottom of your screen, there's going to be a Q&A box, uh, Q&A button. You can click uh, to type in any uh, questions or comments that you have. Um, you can uh, add any question there at any point in time, and we'll get to those uh, um, as they come in or as we start uh, a question and answer section. Um, if you'd like to ask a question uh, aloud or verbally add a comment, um, you can use the raise hand feature down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that sends me a notification that you would like to speak. Um, and when we get to that point, I'll call on you by name and let you know that you uh, have been given the ability to unmute. The floor is yours to ask your question. Um, if you are dialing in by telephone, uh, you can raise your hand in that way by di dialing star nine. Um, and I'll go over that again once we get to, to uh, the point where we will be getting to questions. All right. So um, as I indicated, um, if you just uh, signed on recently and missed the opening, I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, to the public meeting tonight on the uh, I-89-2050 study. Um, and thank you for attending. Um, we're gonna go through the presentation and then uh, as we were just mentioning, we'll take questions, comments at the end uh, in the manner that uh, Sean just has suggested. Uh, so a couple of meeting goals for tonight. Uh, one is to review the interchange evaluation results uh, and we're seeking any feedback on the interchanges to include in what are bundles that we'll be looking at at the next phase. And then also to gather uh, input on what kinds of additional investments should be uh, included in those bundles. Next slide. To give you a little bit of background. Um, this project came out of our long range transportation planning process that we do at the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, the name of that is, uh, we adopted that plan in 2018. It's branded the 2018 ECOS Metropolitan Transportation Plan. And just to give you the sense of priorities that came out of that um, was most of the funding, 70% going to preserve our existing system, 
Uh, then there's a smart growth priority of uh, getting to at least 90% of growth in our villages and downtowns. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We've been averaging in the high 80s. Um, safety improvements, uh, technological improvements, which we call intelligent transportation system investments, and then uh, increased transit, park and rides, carpooling, car sharing, otherwise known as transportation demand management, walking, biking, and then um, and then kind of as a last resort, if all of those things don't have the system functioning properly, then we might look at roadway capacity expansion, but only when needed. Um, and the important point to make here is that this is all part of our larger uh, regional plan that not only talks about transportation, but also talks about our land use goals, climate goals, energy goals, and all of these investments and programs are intended to meet those goals, uh, including the state's climate and energy goals. So I want to make sure people have that context. In terms of this project, um, we are looking at the entirety of 89 within Chittenden County. So it's 37 miles. There are seven existing interchanges. Um, and of course, you can see here the zoom out, you know, in our core urban area, uh, we're spending more attention. We have more issues there. Um, so that, but that's the study area. Okay. And this, this is really a graphic of the scope of work um, that we hired VHB to perform. We're kind of squarely in the middle of this work. Um, you can see we started off with understanding the background, uh, developing a quarter vision and goals. And then in task four, uh, we spent a, a number of months here uh, for good reason, because the interchanges get very complex um, and are giant investments. Uh, so we've spent a bit of time on the interchanges uh, to try to narrow those down. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and now we're turning to a task five, which is actually trying to put things back together in a package of alternatives. And then uh, later this fall and winter, we'll uh, look at developing the recommendations and implementation plan and final report. So just to focus in a little bit about where we are right now, um, you can see here in, in the upper left, we talk about we're in task four, we're trying to finish up task four. We did a, a first round of interchange screening. We started off with 10 different interchanges uh, and got down to uh, five, which is what we were evaluating in this latest round two of a detailed evaluation. And you can see the funnel graphic there in the center. Um, we've kind of tried to shake out the interchanges to narrow that down. And now we'll be looking more holistically. And that's really the stage we're at is identifying what additional corridor or investment should be made in the 89 corridor or in the region uh, to reduce traffic in the corridor. Um, so that's the stage we're at right now. Um, and again, this slide on the left iterates again, task six and text task seven that will uh, be in the future. So, um, Talk about the interchanges a little bit. I mentioned we got down to five after the first round of evaluation of interchanges. We're now down, uh, and these five uh, going from south to north, one was exit 12B. There were two options we looked at in the exit 13 location, and then two options we looked at at exit 14. And Dave will give you a lot more detail on those interchange ideas in a minute. Next slide. And um, so I mentioned we've done uh, a lot of discussion over the last few months about these interchanges. Um, we did uh, bring them multiple times to South Burlington community, committees, council. Um, there was a vote uh, a couple weeks ago uh, at the city council of South Burlington in favor. Uh, it was a 3-2 vote in favor of exit 12B moving forward for further evaluation. And you can see listed there South Burlington committees. Um, most of them favored uh, exit 13. One of the alternatives there, Dave will talk, tell you what the SBDI stands for in a couple minutes. Um, and so you kind of some split opinions about what should move forth to further evaluation. And I do want to uh, pause here for a moment to say um, these decisions and opinions are, are not uh, decisive in what will get done. Uh, this was really just to evaluate what should move forward um, in terms of 
uh, the next step of evaluation. And uh, I see a question uh, in, the, in the comments here. Um, and thank you, Megan Emery, for uh, correctly pointing out uh, the Economic Devel Development Committee actually had 12B and 13 in their recommendation. Next slide. So, um, so we, we got a lot of input um, and we were initially trying to get to a point of either 13 or 12B. And what the project team is uh, putting on the table tonight for your feedback is um, first, let's start with all of the things we can do before we get to big investments in driving. And so you see the first um, the number of items here, investments, public transit, biking, walking, transportation demand management, I mentioned like park and ride lots and ride sharing, the technology, transport intelligent transportation system, any kind of uh, geometric safety operational improvements we could make. Um, and then we included the diverging diamond interchange in this category because it was really reducing um, capacity at exit 14 and really fit in better with encouraging alternative use of other modes uh, and is not a capacity expansion investment. Um, so that is kind of, you can see checks in all those rows for all three bundles. So kind of the intent is let's do everything we can to reduce vehicle traffic um, and then layer on in bundle two, one, bundle that looks at exit 13, single point diamond interchange, and one bundle that would look at exit 12B um, so that we can kind of compare those three alternative bundles to each other in the next phase. And there is still an outstanding question about the capacity of I-89, uh, particularly between 14 and 15, and would a third lane be needed, or can we reduce enough traffic with all of these non- auto investments that we don't need to do any more uh, capacity expansion. So that's kind of, we'll come back to this question. This is um, really what we would like feedback on the most tonight. Um, any details about what kinds of investments should be made or what specific investments in biking, walking, transit, all those other things. Uh, we would love to hear those things and certainly um, any feedback about um, how these three bundles uh, look to you in terms of going to the next um, stage of analysis. So, Dave, anything I missed there? Um, I think you got it. Okay. And next slide. And so I'll turn it over to Dave now uh, to right. talk in more detail about the interchanges. Okay. So to build off of uh, Charlie's comment, we're going to go through the three uh, the three interchanges that um, are proposed to be advanced through one of those three bundles. Uh, so what we have up on the screen now is um, the proposed uh, diverging diamond interchange for exit 14. Um, just to orient folks, um, uh, obviously I-89 is heading north-south. Uh, we have the new the new uh, double tree, Old Sheridan in the upper left, um, uh, Staples Plaza bottom left, uh, Holiday Inn on the on the upper right, uh, CBS in the bottom left, and um, that's kind of the orientation. Um, you can see kind of underneath the existing cloverleaf uh, configuration just to get a sense of scale for this improvement. Um, so, so basically, um, the diverging diamond, it's, it's uh, a bit of a, a unique uh, animal in terms of uh, kind of traffic operations. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the proposal, uh, proposed uh, modifications at exit 16 in Colchester, very similar design. Um, this involves a crossover uh, uh, twice. So for somebody who's coming out of, let's say, out of Burlington and heading towards Williston, you, you're heading eastbound on uh, on Wilson Road, you cross over onto what is essentially the, the other side of the road as you cross over the I-89. You have the option, instead of having to wait at a light to turn left to go north on 89, you have now, this is one of the benefits of a, of a diverging diamond, you have a free movement to be able to head north. And, and this movement in particular is one of the heaviest movements at the interchange, particularly at you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So this really facilitates that, that movement for all of those commuters to head, head uh, back north. Um, and then it's, it's the reverse movement in the, um, in the westbound direction. Um, one of the one of the real benefits, and Charlie alluded to this this concept here, is that um, it's it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but this um, kind of orange line shows a shared use path. So ten foot shared use path on running along both sides of Williston Road, 
Um, and you can see it crossing over into a central 14, 14 foot central shared use path uh, that crosses over 89 and then diverges again uh, in both directions. So what this really does, it facilitates um, as just a hypothetical uh, you know, walking or cycling trip from let's say the Holiday Inn to the Staples Plaza. You, can, you, you will now with, with this, um, this proposed uh, configuration in place, you have a clear path, you're crossing over, you have a signalized crossing um, where you're crossing Williston Road. Uh, you're, 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 you have no, no conflicts as you're crossing over 89 and then another signalized crossing. So this is a, a fully protected movement as you cross. Um, so it, it not only allows you to go across the interstate, but also north, north and south across Williston Road uh, under signal control. So that is the uh, the diverging diamond interchange uh, alternative at, at exit 14. Um, uh, at exit 13, this is another um, uh, somewhat unique configuration referred to as a single point diamond interchange. Uh, again, to orient uh, everyone, um, the existing exit 13 is underneath here. Um, you can see here off to the right Dorset Street. Uh, this is South Burlington City Hall here. Uh, South Burlington High School is just off the screen to the right. Obviously, Spear Street here. Um, and so what we have today, if um, for those of you, I imagine many are familiar with this, um, I-89 has uh, the westbound direction and eastbound direction are split. Um, this proposal brings those together. So it essentially removes the eastbound uh, barrel or east, eastbound direction of, I, of I-189, shifts that north to a, a line adjacent to the, the westbound uh, lanes to effectively create a four lane boulevard similar to Kennedy Drive, just to the east of Dorset Street. So you've got two lanes in each direction, um, potentially with a you know, landscape median. Um, so kind of create, um, uh, moving this less from an interstate facility to more of kind of an urban boulevard um, type, type feel for this roadway. Um, what this then does by bringing both of these approaches in allows um, all of the movements uh, at the interchange to be uh, uh, operated under a, sig a single signal signalized control. And so uh, you can see here all of the on and off ramps kind of all converge at this single point, um, thus the name single point diamond interchange. Um, and what this also does uh, is, is open up all of the movements at the interchange. Um, for those of you who are familiar with exit 13, there are certain movements you cannot make today. So coming from the north, for example, if you want to go to um, Kennedy Drive, you, you can't do that today. Uh, in the future, in this scenario, you would just come off, go through the, the traffic signal and be on your way to the airport or to Kennedy Drive or so forth. So this configuration does open up all of the movements uh, through and um, into, the, uh, into the interchange. And uh, this is just a zoom in of that, that uh, single point. We'll also note this does also include a new shared use path that would connect from uh, the terminus of the existing shared use path on Kennedy Drive and Dorset Street. And this will carry you across um, uh, the interstate along, along this new roadway and then tie into the shared use path at, at uh, Spear Street. So this would be a brand new connection where today there's no ability to walk or cycle across uh, through the existing exit 13. And then the third um, interchange, uh, this is exit 12B. Um, so we've got uh, Heinsberg Road, Route 116, kind of north-south here, uh, Tilly Drive, um, medical, medical office buildings along Tilly Drive. We have Technology Park off to the right here. Uh, the whale's tails are just off the, off the screen to the right. Um, and so this configuration is, is, is a little more typical, although it has, has its unique elements. Um, in this case here, we have uh, the northbound on and off ramps. Um, unlike a typical interchange where all of the movements would be occurring kind of right at the main, uh, the kind of connecting arterial, um, because of some of the constraints, topography and land ownership constraints, um, we're showing the northbound on and off ramps coming off uh, to the east of, the, of Hinesburg Road and teeing into uh, Tilly Drive, um, where then drivers, um, there's a future city street plan, so drivers can then continue north to the airport, for example, or turn left or right um, to go out to Heinsberg Road or through another new connector out into Community Drive and to points east or north. Um, uh, the, south, the southbound movements are much more traditional. So we've got just a typical kind of uh, southbound off-ramp and southbound on-ramp um, in this configuration as shown here. Um, this proposal also includes uh, a new bridge over, over I-89 that accommodates uh, both a shared use path, a 10-foot shared use path on one side and a sidewalk on the other side. So again, greatly enhancing opportunities for cyclists and pedestrians um, to cross safely in this location. Um, so so um, 
we looked at uh, looked at these the, the three interchanges that were just showed, plus the other two that were screened out through the second round process um, through a fairly detailed uh, evaluation matrix process. And that that matrix was really informed by uh, close to forty separate metrics, objective metrics that we looked at for each of those five interchanges. And we aligned those metrics with the six goals that that have been identified for this study. These goals have been identified through a fairly robust process working with, we have a technical committee and advisory committee uh, and got public input on, on these goals. And so you see the first three here, so safety, livable, sustainable, and healthy communities and mobility and efficiency. So those three, those are three of the goals. And you can see the bulleted points here are the metrics that we were using to evaluate each of these interchanges against those. So um, what are the safety implications? What are, how does the ramp spacing affect safety at each of those interchanges? And those were all assigned scores so that we could evaluate these as objectively as possible. Um, this is the second set here. The, uh, so we have environmental stewardship as our goal, uh, economic access, and then system preservation. So that rounds out the six goals and then the um, uh, 38 metrics that we, that we evaluated. Um, so once we were able to um, uh, identify all those metrics, assign scores, do the evaluation, um, what is shown in the top half of this slide are the resulting scores for each of those interchanges. And so uh, just as an example here on the left, this is the exit 12B scores um, kind of summarized by each of the six goals. Uh, so it scored 16 points under safety, 13 points under livable, sustainable and healthy communities and so forth uh, for a total of 74 points. Uh, just to just to note, the green shading indicates which interchange scored the highest in that particular goal. So in this case, Exit 12B scored the high, got the most points of the three uh, for under economic access and so forth. Um, so you can see the total scores here. The SBDI did score under this analysis the highest. Um, and then just to note a couple, I won't read through all of these, but um, there are some important uh, distinctions between the different interchanges that we looked at. Um, one example, so exit 12B uh, was found to have the largest, it has the, the greatest reduction in traffic, existing traffic at exit 12 in Williston. So it, it results in about a 14% decrease in traffic at uh, exit 12. It also has the greatest um, reduction in traffic on Williston Road east of exit 14. So in the kind of windjammer um, uh, uh, section of, of uh, Williston Road, so about a 15% decrease in traffic there. Um, on the other side, it does have the largest uh, kind of public pro uh, private property impacts, uh, impervious area, and it does uh, lead to a, a, the largest percent increase in traffic on 116 just south of I-89. As you can imagine, by putting in the new interchange, you would imagine some additional traffic, primarily in this case, south of, of I-89 on, on 116. Um, I'll skip over the hybrid since that one has uh, been kind of screened out. Uh, but the SBDI, the other alternative that was looked at, um, this one, so this, um, uh, in comparison to exit 12, which really helps ex uh, exit 12B, which helps reduce traffic at exit 12 in Williston, exit 13 has the best the, the best bang for its buck at exit 14. So we see if you build the SBDI by opening up all of those additional movements, we see about a 13% reduction in traffic at exit 14. Uh, and then also about a 17% decrease in traffic on Dorset Street, because uh, this now allows for movements to come in and out of the mall. For example, if you're leaving the mall, not everyone has to head left and go up to Williston Road to get on an exit 14. You now have the option to go south on Dorset Street. Uh, so that greatly uh, improves operations on along Dorset Street. So then the other, um, we also evaluated kind of as separately using all of the same metrics, um, the two options that we looked at at exit 14. Um, the DDI is the one that uh, was showed previously. The, the the plan for that that was the one that scored uh, scored the best and was um, is is advancing forward. Uh, so you can see how that scored against all of the goals. Um, the DDI in particular, the the strengths here, as I mentioned, the kind of the fully signalized path for pedestrians and cyclists. It does result in a net reduction in impervious area, which is a positive thing for for water quality in this in this area, particularly with the Centennial, Centennial Brook uh, immediately adjacent to the interchange. Um, it does also, as Charlie noted, it, there is a, um, a reduction in overall vehicle capacity. Today, we have an, a cloverleaf interchange that has about as much capacity as any interchange can have, all free movements. Um, so by, by shrinking the size and, and slowing some of the movements, putting in those two signalized intersections, we do have some decrease in vehicle capacity. 
Um, and one of the things that we saw by, by reducing the capacity, kind of narrowing the size of the pipe there for, for vehicles, it did send some traffic onto adjacent parallel routes. So in this case, we saw slight increases, about three to 4% increase on the Winooski Main Street Bridge over the, over the Winooski River, so um, just south of the circulator in Winooski, and then Lime Kiln Road on the east side of 89. So, so uh, as you reduce capacity, it does send some trips in other directions um, uh, to find the quickest path to their destinations. Okay, so that's um, that was kind of an overview snapshot of the of the interchanges. Now we'll turn it back to Charlie to go through the uh, the bundles and uh, other potential improvements for the corridor. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I apologize. I hope you couldn't hear me typing. I was doing my best to respond to questions that are in the Q and A. Um, so, um, um, and I just I do want to make. Sure, um, Dave, there was one question that uh, someone heard you say that exit 14 improvement, uh, which I assume they were referring to the DDI, increases capacity at that interchange. Um, can you clarify that it does not? <laughs> that was, if I stated that that was an error, it, it decreases it by about 10% from the current uh, Cloverleaf uh, okay. layout. Thanks, Dave. Um, so um, this is just a, a quick slide, just to give you a flavor of the kind of uh, comments and, and topic areas that we've heard about to date, uh, uh, particularly bike and pet infrastructure, crossing 14, climate change, uh, also some of the interchanges should be improved, uh, HOV and transit lanes, more investment in transit, ITS and technology, noise walls, livable communities, reducing auto dependency and, and widening I-89. So as you can tell, that's a wide range of comments and viewpoints on this. Um, so uh, we're still, really kind of taking more feedback at this point and need to do more analysis. And Dave, next slide. And again, just to um, come back to this slide where we're kind of looking at these bundles, um, one with uh, just a decrease in capacity at the interchanges is bundle one, plus a lot of investments in reducing auto travel. Bundle two is a lot of investments in reducing auto travel and looking at the 13 single point diamond interchange. Bundle three is lots of investments to reduce auto travel and then looking at uh, 12B. And so what we're doing is trying to bundle things. Um, you know, we're looking at 2050, which is almost 30 years away from now um, and seeing you know, what seems to make sense given assumptions about what that future might look like um, with a huge caveat that we know our models and predictions are not exactly right. So that's really um, another task is to really think about the implementation plan, phasing, what should come first. There's a lot of those things in the first step, six rows or so that we should probably be doing sooner and not waiting to do, uh, and then wait as long as possible for any big investments, you know, tens of millions of dollars into the interstate um, for auto traffic absent the need to replace infrastructure, uh, which is also a big consideration here, um, is that there's infrastructure that's over 60 years old now on the interstate and uh, getting to a point in its life where a lot of it will need to be replaced. We wanna be prepared with ideas of how to replace it with the best investment possible. And Dave, I think there's one more slide after this. Yeah, so uh, here's the question to the group. Um, what issues or opportunities do you see for the 89 quarter over the next 30 years? Uh, there's another set of bullets here just to get you thinking, uh, but we'll open it up for comments in a minute. And I think maybe just a couple slides, right, Dave, to talk about next steps. And then we'll come back and we'll sit on this slide, I think, um, the next steps. And just so you expectations, we would like, if you're not able to give us comments tonight, uh, we would like to get them over the next week or so uh, by May 7th if you can, um, and you have uh, mine and Eleni's emails down the bottom. You can also give us uh, feedback uh, through the website, Twitter, or Facebook. Um, we have an advisory committee on May 19th, and so we're having this meeting really to get input into that advisory committee. And I mentioned uh, earlier talking about the tasks here. We'll evaluate the bundles over the next uh, several months. Uh, come back and do more public engagement this fall and winter about what we learned from that evaluation, and then try to get to some degree of closure about how might we move forward. 
Uh, so still more questions and answers that we have at this point, uh, but really looking for your thoughts about uh, what we should do moving forward. Um, so at this point, I think we'll open it up for um, questions and uh, comments. And John, do you want to help us out with that? Definitely. All right, folks. So uh, there are a couple different ways to interact this evening. Um, if you are on a computer or mobile device, down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. You can click or tap on that uh, to enter your question or comment um, uh, by text there. If you would like to ask a question or give a comment verbally, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand button uh, that will send us a notification that you would like to speak. Uh, when your name comes up in the queue, we'll call on you and let you know that you can unmute your mic and we'll hear your question or comment. If you're dialing in by telephone, uh, you can raise your hand uh, in that same way by uh, dialing star nine. Um, and we will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. And Sean, are you so, going to read off questions for us? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> right, yes. So we have a uh, question from Megan Emery. Uh, Megan says, please break down the economic access since we were told that areas within one mile of an interchange stands to gain uh, in economic growth. Please break down the economic access since we were told that areas within one mile of an interchange stand to gain in economic growth. Um, yeah, Megan, we may need to have an offline conversation. I'm not sure I fully understand that. Um, we do in the, um, the projections of growth for this area with or without this study, um, there are certainly uh, projections for growth and employment in this area, in South Burlington in general, in Burlington in general, uh, that's pretty significant uh, and it varies depending on location. Um, so we did do some, in the scoring criteria, um, there was some differentiation. Uh, more jobs are, are expected to occur in the exit 14 area. So that got higher points. Uh, exit 12B I think had the next highest and 13 the third highest. So that was kind of the, um, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the. That's right. That's right, Charlie. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Ian Stokes uh, says, the goals are excellent. However, it seems that they can only be achieved if there is a park and ride, PNR, with a bus stop at e each interchange. Exit 11 has both, uh, but PNR with insufficient capacity. I don't see provision for PNR uh, at any of the proposed interchange plans. For instance, the sections of roadway closed off in the proposed reconstructions could be used for PNR. Yeah, I think that's a, a great comment. Uh, we have not looked at park and ride lots. Uh, it's really what we're proposing to do in this next stage. So uh, we will take that as a recommendation for park and ride lots at interchanges. Um, if you have more detail you want to offer on that, please do. All right. Uh, so we've got a uh, few folks who have raised their hands. Um, Richard Watts uh, is first. Richard, please unmute your mic and we are ready to hear your question. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Um, do you, do you see me or not? All I can see is a little black box. Uh, we will just hear folks' uh, voice when they participate tonight. Okay. Well, um, so I have a couple of concerns about this study as I've articulated before. But a couple of questions, if I may, and then if I could, I'd just like to make a brief comment. Um, do we know when the traffic count assumptions, the, the assumptions that Charlie just mentioned that this is based on, when was the traffic count data collected? And have we thought about the changes that may be happening in, with travel behavior here during this pandemic and how that may or may not affect the future? 
Um, I'm going to say yes to your second question, uh, but I, I'll give you a, a fuller answer. Um, and uh, and to your point, Richard, yeah, the, this is based on data that was pre-pandemic for sure. Um, and so that does in, uh, inject a higher degree of uncertainty and uh, less confidence in the numbers at the at the end of this, you know, that we're projecting. And so I think we've been trying to be uh, very uh, mindful of that issue. And there are other issues beyond the pandemic, right? Um, you know, what, what are electric and autonomous vehicles going to do? Um, are people going to keep working at home uh, from the pandemic? Are, you know, are we going to have new transit systems and technology there? Um, and so we, I think we recognize and, and everybody involved with the study recognize there's a significant significant degree of uncertainty in the future. Um, and so one of the comments or uh, points, if you look at the goal statement for this project, you'll see a statement there about how important it is um, to recognize that uncertainty and to monitor things for the future. Um, and that's why I've been trying to be careful. I hope you've heard me. You know, there are no commitments to doing any of these things, particularly the capacity projects at this point, because there is just too much uncertainty um, and it's too far away. We're going to, we need to keep track of what's happening and see what makes sense, you know, in the succeeding years. Okay, and then a similar question, if I could, Charlie. Um, the overall CCRPC MPO's goal is something like a 2% reduction in VMT by 2050. Is that right? Um, I wouldn't say that was a goal. That was an outcome of um, our analysis of making a lot of TDM investments. Um, and trying to do everything we could to meet the energy plan goals. So it was a, I think it's a 2.4% decrease in vehicle miles of travel um, and a 70 something percent reduction in greenhouse gases because of conversion to electric vehicles, for instance. So um, yeah, those were outcomes of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. And then overall, I think you've told me before, but you think the study now is going to cost somewhere around or up to 900,000. Has that changed at all since in the last three months? Um, that is probably a pretty good ballpark estimate uh, now. And I think, um, you know, it, it could be more depending on how complex the analysis gets in the next stage. So wait, okay, I'm sorry, but you're saying now it could be more than $900,000? That's, that's possible. It really depends on you know, the feedback that we're getting from the community and if more analysis is uh, needed to kind of evaluate those ideas. So I don't want to, I don't want you to walk away from this meeting thinking that is the final number. It may not be. Hey, well, I just want to underscore for folks that two and a half years or so ago when this started, the number was $526,000. And then as little as three months ago, I think Charlie and others said they didn't see it costing more than 900,000. And now I'm hearing that it might be above that. So um, there's lots of issues or different ways you can think about this study, but I'm, I just for a minute want to articulate my biggest concern about it. And that is that it puts roads at the center of planning our future. So we call this Envision 89. And we're going to spend somewhere like $900,000 thinking about a future that kind of circles around this road and the interchanges. Imagine just for a minute if this study was called envision a system that was less car dependent or envision a future that had less dependence by all of us on motorized vehicles and you spent $900,000 on envisioning that future, you would come to different outcomes than what we're gonna to come to tonight. And Charlie said very articulately that the future is uncertain. The assumptions that go into this study are uncertain. I mean, we already know that one of the major assumptions is based on traffic data that was taken before the pandemic. The whole world has changed. People are telecommuting more. People are teleworking more. It's more acceptable to telecommute. Traffic is down and maybe it's gonna bounce back, but we don't know that. So the biggest sort of rethink I think here is that planning, planning should be the guidance of future action. 
planning should be about building the future that we want, not on building a future that's based on questionable assumptions. So what kind of future would we want in 2050? Is it a future that's, you know, puts us all in the same status quo system of being completely dependent on motorized vehicles to get around? And what does that future say for those of us who are too young or too old to drive or people who don't have access to motor vehicles? We know that as a proportion of your income, the less money you make, the higher percent it costs you to live and work in this existing system. And what does it say to this enormous conversation that's going on in this country about racial and social justice? And, and the planners here will tell us where they're taking that into consideration and they're thinking about it. But I think that we're way down this path, but we really, and so and people are thinking, what's the best we can get out of this? And I think it's, we should just stop, pause and let the world, let us take a minute and see what's happening in the world and then think about how we wanna spend and I don't know how much of this is not yet spent. Maybe it's 300 or 400,000. Um, and I'll make a last point and then I'll stop. But that is that some of what we are is in this plan are things that are just inconceivable that will ever be built. Political support aside, but hundreds of millions of dollars for interstates or 100 plus million is on one of these slides for a, uh, an exchange. Where is that? funding going to come from? Do we really want to build out a plan that has in it suggestions that we're going to spend a hundred plus million dollars on an interstate exchange? It's just, it's just unlikely. So yeah. thank you for all your work. I know you guys work really hard at this, but I just think it's about, it's all of the reason it's all about a road is it's all about a road. And if we yeah. really wanted to do things differently, it wouldn't be this project. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for that. And I, I, I think I'll try to give a brief response, which is um, I don't think we are thinking that differently about our future. Um, and I hope you heard me say, like, these capacity ideas are the last resort. Um, so I do think we share the same uh, notion and vision about let's talk about what are the best investments in our community for our future, uh, for the livable, you know, climate friendly, uh, racially just um, and uh, equitable future that we want. And so, um, and the other thing, I just want to take a quibble a little bit with Richard's characterization, because uh, I don't want anybody listening to this to think that there's a plan. We do not have a plan to do any of these things we are exploring options at the moment. And you are part of that process and we welcome all feedback to help us ex make sure we're exploring the right options and the best options. So this is really a critical time to tell us about all the other things that you think should be done in and around these interchanges. Uh, for better or worse, A89 is here. It carries a ton of traffic um, and it is a barrier in our community. Uh, this is an opportunity to try to get to a better future uh, than what we have now. So I'll take the next question, John, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Charles. Uh, the next person with their hand raised uh, is Noah. Noah, please unmute. We're ready for your question. Can I be heard? Yeah. Yes. All right, I would like to uh, <clears throat> first thank um, everyone on, on these various committees for all of the work. I know it can be thankless, and I appreciate everything you're trying to, to do for South Burlington. Um, my question, um, um, it may be simple, it may be not. Uh, it, it may have been covered before. Um, this is my first time attending one of these meetings on um, I-89. Um, I have a question about the scoring evaluation summary um, for the various exits that were proposed. Um, how are they weighted or valued? Um, I don't, I'm not trying to argue any one in particular. I would just like to know, uh, is there a place for me to find how exit 13 or 14 was 
rated higher or lower for economic impact or environmental friendliness, et cetera. That is all. Thank you. Yeah, there is um, the Dave presented a, a real uh, kind of bottom line summary, uh, scoring summary. There is, if you go on the website, um, yeah, those, uh, there, uh, there are more details. Um, there's a, a detailed matrix, and Dave can maybe tell me what that is called uh, or where it is, but. Um, there's there's not, a link to it right on the homepage, envision89.com, to the full, the full matrix. Yeah. And then to, I think if you were asking like how were uh, different uh, metrics weighted, um, the, I think the simple answer to that is we had six goals, which Dave reviewed uh, earlier. Those six goals um, in the initial scoring were weighted equally. Um, so safety was just as important as uh, the economy was just as important as uh, preservation. Um, so, um, and so that meant because there were different numbers of metrics in each of the goals, there was um, some math done to normalize the scoring so that each of the goals got equal weight. Hope that helps, Noah. All right, thank you, Noah. Thank you, Charles. The next person uh, waiting to speak uh, has the username M uh, M Bead M Bede. Please unmute your mic, and we're ready for your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, it's Marta. Um, I also want to thank all of you for providing so much detail and such an in-depth study. Um, so that's really appreciated. Um, I have basically a, a, com a couple comments and a question. Um, in terms of the comments for, I, I'm here representing a few of my neighbors that live um, at Heatherfield, which backs up to where the exit 13 interchange is. And it's, it's a pretty tight space already. So um, one of the questions would just be if you can speak to how that would increase traffic and noise. Um, and if you have gotten far enough to think about what kind of environmental buffer you would have, because it's, if you look at the diagrams you presented, you could also like see the houses, how close it is, because they're on your diagram. So we, are, we have some concerns about that and any expansion um, there. And um, also, I, I can't back this up with <laughs> a study, but it does seem like there's a wildlife um, corridor here, um, just from what we observe. And so that would be a consideration. And the other third consideration would be that there's a lot of, you know, there's two s schools there and a lot of foot traffic we have going back and forth. So the idea of expanding and building out a highway in that area where we already are walking um, and what the impact would be on our schools and the residential communities that are really right central to that area. So the question would be on the impact of this on the school and the residential neighborhoods with an exit 13 alternative, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I think one thing I'll note is um, that we have not heard back from the school district. So that is definitely a constituency that we would like to get some more feedback from. And Dave, I don't know if you have more specific answers to her question. Yeah, um, you know, one, I guess, overarching answer and I can get into some of the specifics, but um, this is still very kind of concept level design. And um, this would have to go through a very rigorous environmental review process. Um, if any of these interchanges were to move forward. And so if, if an interchange 13 were to move forward, um, basically everything that you enumerated, so noise impacts, environmental impacts, um, uh, traffic impacts, those would all need to be um, you know, identified specifically and mitigated uh, to the extent that there are significant impacts. And so you know, if we're talking noise walls or you know, environmental mitigation, um, stream buffer plantings or those types of things. Um, so at, at this stage, at kind of the planning stage, um, we don't necessarily get into that level of detail. We did look at um, pot potential environmental implications. Um, for this neighborhood in, specifically, we did identify, we, we looked um, from a noise perspective of the two options that were uh, that we looked at at exit 13, uh, 
Um, we did feel that this, the, the SBDI, the single point diamond interchange, had less noise Im implications uh, to the Heatherfield neighborhood specifically uh, because it, it pulls the ramps further away from, uh, from the neighborhood as opposed to the hybrid, which you didn't see tonight, but that one had ramps much closer to the neighborhood. So that was a consideration kind of as part of the overall scoring as well. Well, thank you for considering that. That's good news to hear. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I totally understand that some of those are longer term, but want to just um, representing this neighborhood and kind of living close to it represent some of the things that cross our minds mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about development in this area um, affecting all three of those things. So if you can just take that into consideration as you determine which um, what did you call it? Um, what are you calling them? The little buckets or <laughs> uh, bundles? Bundles. bundles. Yes. <laughs> the bundles that you're looking at. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for taking input too. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. All right. So I would like to uh, recognize we have lots of written questions um, and many people whose hands are raised. So for the time being, we're going to take one more hand uh, and then go to, uh, for a moment, the written questions and then uh, bounce back and forth. Um, so Megan Emery uh, has her hand uh, raised. Megan, if you have something to add from your, your previous question, uh, please unmute and we are ready. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good, all right. Yeah, just to build off of um, the committees in South Burlington, as well as one of my questions, and I can I can wait for that to be answered, but regarding federal guidelines and policy uh, in response to to our you know our carbon emissions and and the goals to reduce them and and uh, really face our responsibility with regard to climate change, um, something I said at the April nineteenth meeting is that I will be coming forward uh, this coming Monday with a resolution uh, whereby the South Burlington City Council will be considering all future policy decisions through a climate change lens. And I asked my fellow counselors to hold off on this vote until we could look at that resolution and, and deliberate with regard to specifically um, this study, as well as all the future decisions that we'll be making. Um, how, how could that resolution potentially um, participate in future discussions that you have with the public or with the advisory board? Uh, I would certainly like to submit it to you. Uh, we're certainly happy to take that input. Um, and um, sorry, there was a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, but I, I think one thing I'll say to you is that, you know, I think we do have an obligation um, to address the issue of climate change. I don't know that the federal government has gone much further than that, but I think our state government has gone even further uh, to get to 90% renewable um, and other climate goals, you know, that will probably get stronger, you know, over the course of the next year or two. So um, I, I think we're in, uh, in agreement that we need to make sure we're addressing those goals. So, um, you know, and we will uh, take any feedback on, on how to do that better, but uh, it certainly is a shared goal. So, so for instance, one of the things that I've been discussing with constituents is the, the land that will be taken up by these interchanges could be used for, for housing or, or for biking and, and pedestrian infrastructure or for, uh, civic services that could be closer to residential areas south on Vermont 116. And I would see that as a reduction in the need for the use of cars and motorized vehicles um, of all kinds. And that this should be our goal uh, because we know, I believe it's the second greatest contributor to the carbon emissions, it's, it's traffic. Um, and so if we think about exit 13 being just a half a mile away, from the 12B interchange, does that make sense to, to use that land for, for an interchange when it could be used for housing uh, and ideally affordable housing so that more people could live closer to those employment centers? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right, so we're going to bounce over to uh, some of the written questions. 
um, um, Charles or uh, one of the other, oh, sorry, okay. So we've got a question from Ethan Pepin. Uh, why is non-standard design listed as a weakness? Uh, FHWA and AASHTO standards have been slow to adapt and innovate and have uh, favored designs and lane widths that have been proven to be suboptimal. Dave, you got that one? I, I think that may be referring to the left turn uh, exit and entrance on, I, I'm not sure what that was referring to. I, I believe it's for the DDI, and um, oh. it, it's a very good point that that Ethan makes. And um, really, um, th there weren't a lot of weaknesses with the DDI, to be honest. And so we wanted to identify some things. And and you know, one one whether you you term it as a weakness or not, it is something that drivers will be unfamiliar with, and um, particularly the first time they drive through it. And um, there hasn't been kind of precedent for large kind of collisions or or increases in crashes, but it is something that. Um, takes some getting used to. Just like round, when, when roundabouts were introduced, it took a little bit of getting used to. People were scared, and now you know you don't think twice about it. So it is just a little bit different than the kind of usual, particularly with your drive. You know, when you're driving on the other side of the roadway. Um, but the, a good geometric design, you won't really know the difference. All right, thank you. So we've got another question um, from uh, Erica Quallen. Uh, she asks, or she says, I appreciate uh, the shared youth pa use paths at all of these interchanges, but what are they connecting, particularly on Heinsberg Road, since there isn't a path this far out? Also, will Williston Road path actually happen for this to connect to? Yeah, so, well, uh, Dave, you may know the answer to this better than I do, but I do believe that South Burlington does plan for uh, a path down Heinsberg Road, um, so this would be consistent. Um, and have, uh, you know, to do that over an interchange, the, well, the interchange there where 116 crosses I-89. And there are, um, you know, sidewalk just recently built to the north there. So there is something to connect to. I think um, if I understand the questioner rightly asking, what's it connecting to going south? That infrastructure is still a need. And that's, you know, this is long range planning. So. Uh, there are things out there that certainly aren't done yet that are um, in others' plans, particularly the city of South Burlington. Um, and I do think uh, going north, it would be uh, to connect to a path on Williston Road ultimately as well. And Dave, I don't, do you have any more detail on that? Uh, the Williston Road path, I think she may be referring to the, um, uh, the kind of complete streets conversion of Williston Road. And um, I don't know if we have other representatives from the city who could speak more to the timing of that, but I, I believe that's still advancing. Yeah, yeah, and I believe there's a path um, even in the busiest section of Williston Road, like from Dorset to Kennedy, mm -hmm. connecting as well. So, thank you, Erica. All right, thank you. Uh, so we've got another question. Um, this is from Jesse Robbins. Uh, how does the bike and pedestrian bridge at Exit 14 that was studied by CCRPC and Stantec fit into the plans for the exit? The double diamond exchange will be a slight improvement for non-automobile traffic, but this is the busiest section of road in Vermont, and a completely separate bike uh, and pedestrian facility would be much, much better. I live and work in Burlington and bike for many errands, but after one trip, won't cross 89 at Williston Road. Yeah, so uh, we will definitely uh, take this as a comment supporting uh, that bike head bridge. Um, for those of you that may not know, uh, we work with the city of South Burlington uh, and there's a, a conceptual plan for a separated bike head bridge just south of exit 14, um, closer to uh, you know, like entering into the back of U-Mall. Um, and one of the conversations has been is that maybe that's uh, an earlier stage investment that gets made. And whenever the structure, the bridge at exit 14 needs to be replaced, maybe that's the time that we uh, improve that with a DDI or some other improvement that makes it better for bike paths there. But in the meantime, there's an alternative uh, to the current bike path there. Um, so um, the one doesn't necessarily replace the other, but they could both be supportive of each other.
we've got a question from uh, Sriram uh, Srinivasan. If the implementation had to be prioritized for material reasons, can 14, 13, and 12b be approached on a sequential need basis? I guess I'm wondering what's the top priority for uh, Chittenden County. Sorry that I don't pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Chittenden County, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this process will help inform the priorities. The, we don't know what the priorities are yet, um, and that's certainly more to this process over the coming months to try to get to a better answer to this question. Uh, so I wish I had a better answer uh, for him uh, at this point, uh, but I think this that is part of the purpose of the study and that uh, when we talked about um, step six, past six in this uh, project, the implementation plan, this kind of question about um, sequencing and prioritization uh, and phasing will definitely be part of that task. All right, thank you. Um, so again, we're going to take uh, one more written question and then go uh, back over to the verbal questions. Um, Michael uh, Mitag asks, um, comparing exits 13 and 12B shows that there would be much higher land acquisition costs for 12B because the land for exit 13 is already federally owned, right? Dave, I'm going to look for you to shake your head yes, but I believe that is a correct answer, yes. That is correct, yes. All right, uh, very good. Then um, as someone who's raised their hand, I see Tony Reddington. Tony, please unmute, and we are ready for your question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Charlie, and thank you, uh, uh, David, for your work uh, on this. Uh, I'll make some general comments, and I, I do expect to submit uh, written comments uh, by the 7th of May, according to the deadline you've given. Um, I, I'm sort of in the same vein as uh, Richard Watts that uh, I'm concerned, and, and it centers on the roads at the center of our future and using the term envision. Uh, I think it's an, in the case of interstate exits, it's a non, it's, it's, it's an oxymoron to say that we're, we're envisioning something uh, as with cars at the center of our future and, and, and talking about bike lanes and, and pedestrian safety and so forth at interstate exits. I just think it's a, there's a clash of, of, of a sense of where we're going. Um, I found that I, in the last year, I think a lot of us have been acting differently because of the pandemic. And I realized, oh, wow, I haven't taken a, I've, I have successfully not taken an air trip, um, uh, an air, uh, air trip uh, since the beginning of the um, pandemic. And I'm uh, more than a year now without air travel. But then I thought about this, these exits and the interstate. I also have the situation in which I have never, I have not been on an interstate highway in over a year. Uh, I, I wasn't purposely trying to avoid uh, I-189 or I-89, but uh, so this, this whole discussion is sort of foreign to me in a way, living in Burlington. Mm -hmm. My name again is Tony Reddington. I've had, as you know, a couple of decades as working for the Vermont and New Hampshire Departments of, of Transportation. Um, some of the comments uh, th that are related. It was interesting that you showed one matrix in which you showed uh, that safety uh, scored higher on a particular option, and you, but it didn't win the uh, preferred option, so to speak, in the, in the overall matrix. Just note again that safety should be the most important thing. Equal weighting is, is really really is not fair. Um, we note that the AAA, uh, which uh, has done a study of metro uh, needs and congestion, and this a lot of what's been talked about here really is is dealing with with handling more cars or or the cars that we have more efficiently. The AAA Foundation has done a key study. You you folks are aware of it. It's the uh, Cambridge Systematic Study of of metropolitan transportation uh, areas in the country. And they found in the larger ones that, that uh, serious injuries and fatals were twice the cost of congestion. Uh, and, and even for the smaller metros like Burlington, that was also the case. I think we need to keep that in mind. Uh, the United States is 19th in the highway, 18th in highway safety in the world. We have used to be number one. We have 21,000 excess 
deaths, a, a, a pandemic of deaths on the roadways, uh, perhaps about 35 deaths here in Vermont are in ex ex excess. And uh, 2020, even though we, we know we decreased our, our car travel, but we had a surge of 13, of 8% in fatalities. And the pedestrian uh, death rate in the last, uh, uh, the number of pedestrian deaths in, uh, nationally has increased by 50% in the last decade. Um, so I'd like to point out that this, if you look at the structure of the Regional Planning Commission, I want to say some good things about Chittenden County and Regional Planning Commission in a moment. But if you look at the, the uh, makeup and the way we vote, I think we've all been hearing about how important one person, one vote is in the uh, uh, today and, and how it made a difference in, in this recent election. We, we have an antiquated system of voting at the Regional Planning uh, Commission's in, this, in Vermont and probably most states where it's one town, one vote. It's not one person, one vote. Um, I sort of speak about how Jericho has a vote and Underhill has a vote and Burlington has a vote. They're all equal. Uh, th this is a problem. And I think this particular planning exercise is an example of a, of a, as a, a result of, of not having a fair representation of, of uh, concerns and interests. Let's talk about I-189. Uh, it's the one that only one that comes into Burlington or our border. Um, and the traffic on that actually peaked in the 1990s. It's about 20 to 25% below its peak. And in the last decade or so, it's down about 8 or 10% when it hits, hits Shelburne Road, Route 7, um, by, the, uh, uh, by the shopping centers on, on uh, Route 7 on Shelburne Road. Um, and also the north-south travel. This is before the pandemic, by the way. This is pre-pandemic. And north-south travel in Burlington uh, on the southern part of the city, and I think you're familiar with the fact I've looked at these, this data, uh, both Pine Street and, and, and South uh, uh, and, and Shelburn Road uh, are down single digits from the time they peaked again in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, tra traffic is not growing except in a few sections of, of the interstate. Uh, and the fact that the, the fact is that we should be first investing in safety and in the needs uh, of, of safety in our region, rather than in thinking about changing the interstate, uh, interstate highway exits. Let's take an example. We have in Burlington 20 intersections on the high crash uh, list of 111 that the state has. Uh, as you know, we're building the roundabout at, at one of those at the 21st intersection, uh, which was a high crash intersection in uh, on Shelburne Street uh, at the so-called Rotary. That's that took 20 years to address that that dangerous high crash intersection. Uh, we have 20 other intersections that require that, and I'm sure there are many other intersections in the in the county that are on the high crash list. I would think that that's where we should be putting our money if we have any money over and above maintenance of the systems, not in looking at any kind of capacity increase. We're worrying about how we move pedestrians other than maybe that one uh, separate uh, bridge that you've talked about, Charlie. I think that's probably a good idea to, to get pedestrians away from uh, the uh, Williston Road exit and, and bring them over to the uh, uh, shopping center. Um, I think that the one of the problems we have, and, and it hasn't come up yet, is that in Burlington, uh, we have the area from roughly uh, uh, in, a, in the Champlain Parkway area over to over to uh, uh, Winooski, the entire town of Winooski, that whole north, old north end, King Maple and Winooski itself. It's really the old economic engine of the county. Uh, but today is actually Povertyville with 26 to 29 percent of the residents who are poor. And and. That those those interest, those uh, areas uh, in in Winooski and in Old North End, uh, thirty percent of them don't even have access to a car. It's, it's why I mean it's so jarring to be talking about the interstate. And and I think that there's we're finding that the the issues of economic justice and social and ra and, and racial justice are very much at stake in our in in, in both the uh, in in Winooski and in the older. Uh, neighborhoods of Burlington, that, and those desperately need attention. And, and I think that hopefully, uh, as I think Richard Watts also referred to economic justice, that we, we need to reorient ourselves in terms of where the real needs of our lower income population and our 
minority pop and, 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 and persons of people, and, uh, persons of color, let's be quite clear, uh, persons of color are, are, are not in a good place in transportation in the Burlington area. Now, um, finally, uh, in terms of priorities, you know, we've got to, we're talking about $100 million projects here at these, these exits. We talked about at the University of Vermont, the STEM building, the big science, uh, physics and, and math building, that was $100 million. And the, the expansion of the uh, uh, hospital, recent uh, new rooms, which are de definitely needed in the, uh, you know, in the new wing, uh, $100 million. And actually the Champlain Parkway, when you add in, and I wanna thank the Regional Planning Commission for supporting uh, the uh, real enterprise project that will allow us to, uh, when it's put together with the parkway, to, to give us a choice to avoid cutting the King Maple neighborhood, uh, which is a pure case of, of uh, environmental and racial injustice, to be able to bypass that intersection by, by combining in some manner, in some phase, a, uh, the real enterprise project uh, and Champlain Parkway. Thank you, Regional Planning Commission, because when Charles Simpson and I attended one of your meetings, Charlie, it was two years ago, um, there was discussion of the Rail Enterprise Project, and you used the term dream or vision of the Rail Enterprise Project. Well, uh, thankfully, because in, in part because your support and the Commission's support, that is a real project now, uh, and it's a, it, 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 would, it can very well be a solution to uh, that we're all moving to so that we have a good quality uh, uh, a Champlain Parkway project and go forward, uh, 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 which would not have been possible without this rail enterprise uh, bypass. Um, I think I'll sort of leave it there. I've got some other comments. Uh, I, I think that the, the, um, uh, the issues have been pretty well drawn here. There's a lot of money. All the projections of traffic are really, as you point out, Charlie, uh, they're pre-pandemic and they are certainly less, uh, less firm than, than they were even a year ago. Um, I want to thank you for your time and I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, again, Tony Reddington, I live in, uh, on St. Paul Street in Burlington. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Tony, and we'll look forward to getting your comments by the 7th. Thank you. All right, so the next person we've got here is uh, Jerry Silverstein. Jerry, please unmute. We are ready for your question. So thank you. I'll start with the question and I'll explain it. Should you at some point down the road choose 13 or 12B, what plans will the transportation planners have for exit 14, which I do not believe can continue to exist in its current configuration? I moved here in 85, going into Burlington every day from South Burlington. I never thought about it. Um, I cycle year round. Now, anytime I cross that area, I am always like an owl with a 360 degree head looking in every direction possible, trying to figure out how I can safely get from point A to point B. So if you were to elect either 12B or 13, my question is, do the transportation planners understand that exit 14 cannot continue to exist that it is currently configured? as time goes forward. Um, I'm gonna say that I think you're you know, um, addressing some of what could be uh, covered in this study as it moves forward. Um, you know, one of the things we're looking at in the bundles um, is the for bundle number one does have a redesign of exit 14 um, to uh, be much safer for bicyclists and pedestrians uh, and slow vehicle traffic through there. Um, so yeah, I think that's your uh, one of the central questions we're trying to get to is is the question you just asked. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, and the next person is uh, Marcy Murray. Marcy, please unmute, and we are ready for your question. Great, thank you. Uh, so regarding the work you've been doing, I appreciate all the good intentions and also the sensitivity that you have to the three two vote that happened in South Burlington recently. <clears throat> um, and I encourage you to give the climate crisis related items, uh, excuse me, more weight 
than the other goals, given that everything, including the economic access goal, will be affected by how we address climate change. And in making any interchange selection, it is very important to be forward thinking enough to imagine a non-car centric future and to ideally use a climate crisis filter to incorporate the cost of carbon, both of construction of whichever, if any, interchange is constructed and also the cost of carbon that would result in, in the post-construction usage. Um, and then as a resident um, uh, in one of the large neighborhoods off Route 116, it's clear that um, exit 12B, if that were to go forward, would definitely harm the quality of life in nearby neighborhoods by increasing the already significant traffic noise, which right now can be significant depending on the weather. Um, uh, we can hear the interstate quite loudly at times already. Um, and then be, due to the fact that 12B would increase traffic on Heinsberg Road by an estimated 39% south of that new exit, um, that would slow residents' travel time to grocery stores and schools. It could negatively affect air quality from the increased admissions of that increase of 39% in new traffic. And it can make it much more stressful and less safe to bike to Williston Road um, and in addition to perpetuating uh, sprawl. I think it's really important, and I know this is a South Burlington issue, but given that four key committees did not recommend 12B, um, I'm including the Planning Commission, Energy Committee, Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, and Natural Resources Committee. I think it's very important to be very cautious about considering adding 12B. And I applaud um, City Councilor Emery's plan to introduce a resolution to use a climate crisis filter when considering future planning and spending. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I just want to, Sean, I know you're going to uh, call the next uh, question, um, but I'm noting that we have uh, probably 50 something questions that want to be asked or people that want to get uh, questions on the table with uh, less than 40 minutes left. So if people could kind of try to keep their comments down to a minute or two, um, maybe we can get through all of them before, the, before nine o'clock. So thank you very much. All right, and thank you, Charles. Um, for the next raised hand, uh, we do have Erica Quallen. Erica, please unmute. We are ready for your question. Hello, everyone. Um, very good to see this project team. Um, really great work that's been put forth here. Uh, first, I will keep this quick, Charlie, I promise. Um, no problem. First, I would like to just push back on a couple things. Vehicle miles traveled is actually the exact same as it was pre-pandemic. It was down at first, but it has gone back to where it was. Um, people are just aren't traveling at peak hours. Um, but my thought, um, a lot of, since climate change is coming up with the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, with an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas by 2050, AKA the year that this is looking at, um, I really wish we could do that reduction through bike and ped facilities, but I think that it's going to be so much more the shift to electric vehicles. Um, and although park and rides may not work the greatest, but they are great, at, um, providing stops for people to charge up their vehicles. Um, so I would recommend at least having some stops like that that you're looking at um, to reduce that range anxiety along this corridor, um, particularly people that are doing long haul trips through here. My other, uh, my actual question is, um, is there any land use modeling that's going on in tandem? So you're knowing where the new trips are coming from since so many kind of smart growth designations and uh, city center type developments are happening, just so you know really where the new traffic is coming from. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, on the land use side, that, that is a really good question and, and really central to the climate change and uh, ability to use other modes, right? Um, it's very hard to live in a rural area and you know walk to work if your office is 10 miles away. Um, and so um, that 
two, I think two, two answers to that. One is um, we did try to bake into our long range plan, getting denser as, as an urban area. Um, so, um, and we set out a target of 90% of new housing units in the areas where we already have existing infrastructure. Uh, and I mean that in the broad sense. Um, and then secondly, with specific regard to this, we did take another look at what would happen, particularly uh, with any of these interchange investments, um, if they were gonna attract more growth. And so there's um, an additional increment of land use modeling, kind of considering those changes in land use um, and, and primarily the, um, the most significant finding. And you can find this online, you can see, uh, the technical memo, and I think it may be referred to as a Delphi panel. Uh, Dave can correct me if there's a better uh, re name for that link. But yep. um, but was that there was going to be uh, 12B would attract more development to that area, uh, but some of that would come from more rural parts of the county or even outside the county. And so from a land use perspective around smart growth and climate change, that actually was, you know, could be seen as a positive. Uh, but the local impacts, you know, are another part of the consideration. Um, are those local impacts worth the bigger picture? So, um, you know, there's a lot of competing tensions here. Uh, land use is definitely a huge factor in this. Um, and we're not growing that fast uh, relative to the rest of the country, uh, but there is still some opportunity to get a smarter land use pattern. Um, and, and really that really talks is increasing density. Um, so I'll leave that at that. Um, what's the next question? Thank Tom. you. So for now, we'll take uh, one more hand and then move back over to the written questions for a bit. Um, Sarah Sortino, please unmute your mic. Uh, we are ready for a question. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, we yes. can. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. So I just kind of wanted to reiterate the point that um, Given the fact that we are in a climate emergency, um, trying to envision a future with more car infrastructure is really unacceptable. And um, millions of dollars that we do have access to really shouldn't be going to upholding the status quo. And we really do have a lot of work to do in order to make Burlington sustainable. And we brand ourselves to be sustainable. And this money should really be going to transforming this infrastructure. We really have to incentivize train, transit, electric bike riding, um, and just, you know, public transit in general. But yeah, I mean, this, this project really doesn't serve to reimagine um, our transportation system and expanding infrastructure for vehicles that rely on the industry. That's destroying our planet and, you know, taking away all prospects for a enjoyable future for the rest of my life is not, um, <laughs> it's not really, it's not, that's not envisioning a better future. And, um, you know, I trust that people have good intentions in doing this work, but I mean, you know, I think a lot of the considerations that are being considered just aren't like pe pe y'all are considering um, like, you know, the implications on the environment and on marginalized people, but expanding this infrastructure in the first place is negatively impacting marginalized people and affecting our environment. So I really think that we really just need to be shifting all resources over to a dramatic shift away from car infrastructure because there, there's really no way forward um, along these lines. So, yeah, really just think about it. Um, yeah, and I, and I feel... any more specific suggestions of like what kinds of investments or uh, efforts would help move that shift? Uh, please send along after you know after the meeting today or whenever. We're, yeah, we're... I mean, I think that you know investing any money that is being put towards this project in you know, bike lanes and electrifying the um, bus fleet um, and just expanding the bus fleet and the the routes that, you know, buses cover and things like that would definitely be worthwhile. Thank you. Because we are in a crisis here, so. 
You should treat it like one. All right, so thank you. We will move over to uh, some more of the written questions. Um, uh, I know we've uh, got a few. Um, Megan Emery again asks, uh, does the federal government provide specific guidelines regarding road infrastructure in line with federal policy designed to re uh, reduce carbon emissions? Yeah, I think, I think I answered that verbally earlier. So. Okay, you're good. Um, then uh, we've got Tony Reddington. Uh, let me know if this was also part of his conversation. Uh, what is the absolute reduction in serious and fatal injuries in these proposals versus uh, investing those same funds in the many high crash intersections in the county, 20 alone on the federal system? Um, BTV. Yeah, I don't think we have the answer to that specific question. Um, and um, it's a little bit of a false premise, I think. Um, we're certainly investing in those high crash locations is going to happen long before we make an investment in one of these interchanges. Um, so um, I, I guess I kind of want to respond, yes, uh, we, should, we should address those high crash locations. All right, thank you. Um, and we've got a question uh, from Serum again. Uh, what does the mobility efficiency safety metrics take into consideration? Uh, sorry, do they take into consideration mega trends like shared EVs, self driving truck fleets and cars, e bikes, and other small motorized modes of transportation? Uh, Dave, my, my quick answer to this would be uh, not too well yet. Um, I think this is another area where we've said we need to see how the world evolves to better understand the implications of those uh, changes. Uh, it's correct to point out the changes, we just don't know exactly how they're going to affect. Um, our community yet, mm -hmm. and and maybe just to add to that, the um the, the the funnel chart did show one of the one of the steps that will come up is this is developing identifying triggers, and so the idea is that none of this infrastructure would move forward if the traffic uh, congestion never materializes. So if people continue to work from home and you know are are, are biking and walking more, um, that trigger will never get met, and so these interchange enhancements would never move forward. So there's that mechanism there. To handle those unknowns about you know what what the next twenty years will look like from a traffic perspective. Thank you. Uh, our next question, uh, Roseanne Greco asks: Have you held meetings with the folks in Williston? If so, what was their view of Exit Twelve B? Um, geez, that's kind of a layered uh, response. Um, we did have a public meeting there uh, last year, asking for feedback. I think. I can't remember the exact feedback we got. Um, we did not have the same conversation with the Wilson Select Board as we did with South Burlington um, because uh, we had just finished a process that was rather lengthy and complicated called CERC Alternatives, uh, in which we worked with the city uh, or the town of Williston to come up with a lot of uh, transportation investments to address issues in Williston. Um, so, uh, and you know, in terms of what their view on 12B might be, um, they might really like it because it would take some traffic off of 2A uh, and off of exit 12. Um, and I think that is probably a conversation we do need to have in this uh, in this next round of engagement this fall uh, to get a little bit wider uh, view from all the municipalities and, and certainly the impact of municipalities in Jenny County. But Dave, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was good. Yeah, thanks. Right, um, and uh, similar to a question just before, uh, Gordon Miller asks, any, Chris, uh, any consideration for self-driving vehicles? How would that impact traffic? I don't have a better answer than my previous one. Uh, we don't know yet, um, it is, but it's an important thing that we need to keep track of. So um, nothing, nothing is being presumed or assumed yet about that. And, and there are scenarios out there, you know, amongst the experts that, I think self-driving cars uh, are either going to save a lot of traffic if we go to a shared mobility model, or if we go to a place where you know your car drives you into work and then drives back home, we could have even a lot more miles of travel, even if they're electric and not spewing emissions. Uh, we could have more traffic. So that story is yet to be told, and and I think there's a lot of decisions 
that will be in front of our community broadly to figure out how to handle uh, that new future. All right, thank you. Um, Trisha uh, Gustafson asks, uh, how do these proposals affect the traffic on Kennedy Drive? Kennedy has become so busy over the last several years and excessive speed is a huge issue. It's mainly a residential area between Heinsberg Road and Williston Road. Dave, do you remember the kind of yeah, numbers there? I just looked at the spreadsheet. It's about a five to 7% decrease, um, depending on which alternative you're looking at. So 12B and the 213s, it's, uh, and so this is, this is Kennedy Drive east of Heinsberg Road. Um, there's a slight increase west of of uh, Heinsberg Road, but the section that the questioner was asking about east, it sounds like east of Heinsberg Road. There is the e any one of the three would reduce traffic slightly, less than ten percent uh, east of Heinsberg Road. Thanks, Dave. All right, thank you. Um, so we've got. Uh, Daniel M., who asks, uh, listed as an investment in all of the bundles, is investments in public transit and investments that would decrease the number of highway trips. Could you talk a bit about what those improvements might be? What percent of the total investments would go to these items? Um, well, I think in terms of what those specific things are, um, that is part of what we were asking for feedback on. What, what would you like to see those things be? Um, and uh, you know, in the in our initial long range planning, uh, we were hoping that we could get to a place that would kind of double transit service. I don't remember the dollar figure, Daniel. I apologize, um, but um, I think we can uh, kind of put that together uh, when we put these bundles together and get a better picture of that. Um, and I apologize for not being able to recall those dollar figures. Um, it was significant, you know, partly because transit, of course, is not a one-time investment. There's ongoing operating, um, so it's significant. Uh, Eleni or Jason, do you happen to remember that any better than I do? Um, I don't remember it, Charlie, but I'm looking for it right now. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe, uh, yeah. maybe you can uh, at, respond to that one in writing. If you can. Yes, I will. All right, uh, so another written question. Um, Andrea Morgante asks, uh, what criteria were used by the economic committee that made it decide that 12B was the best? Is that because there is so much available real estate to be developed? You're gonna have to ask the economic development committee. I'm sorry, I wasn't uh, in the conversation. Um, I know that they felt um, that uh, getting an investment in higher paying jobs around exit 12B ought to be a higher priority. Um, and Dave, I don't know if you can remember a little bit more flavor of that, their position, but I, I hesitate to speak for them. So apologies. Yeah. yeah. I guess the, the question asked what criteria we use, they, they did use all the, all six metric or all six goals and all the same criteria that, that all the other committees were looking at. You know, and that's what they had available to them. And right. Clearly, yeah. I mean, my takeaway from their position was that they were weighting the economic goal much more significantly than the other goals. Um, yeah. If you wanted to try to quantify what happened there. All right. Thank you. Um, we've got Ashley Truax asks, uh, there seem to be many signal intersections added. Uh, can you talk to why we do not see more rotary or fluid traffic options? Can the multi-use paths be removed from the intersections altogether with overpass, underpass? Dave, I'll let you take that, that design question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so at the exit 12B interchange, um, it, it may have been hard to see on the screen, but we did note, so next to each of the traffic signals, we do have a roundabout icon. So we're kind of staying um, non-committal to which, which um, kind of uh, control happens at those intersections. Um, and then at, at the exit 13 and 14 options, we did look at roundabouts as alternatives to the signals. And um, just given the, the volume and the directionality and the turning movements at those intersections, um, we would have needed at, at exit 13, for example, a three lane roundabout um, to accommodate those, uh, the, the trips at the, um, instead of a signal, a single signal at the intersection. So we did look at roundabouts and we, we did um, want to give, you know, equal, equal weight to both. Um, but in those cases, signals did operate better. And what about multi-use paths being able to be overpass or underpass? My my quick 
non-expert uh, response would be, yeah, I think that, that starts to decrease the use when they're separated from the main line, but um, I don't know if you have a response to that, Dave. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, that is the case. If you know, if you're going under, if you're going through kind of a dark area, people don't feel safe. If you're going over, you're 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 climbing, and so people don't necessarily want to expend the extra extra energy. As an example, the 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 exit 14 overpass, though, in that case, you may you know, given the topography in the area, that may be more of a straight shot. If you're going from CVS to Staples Plaza, not quite as much of a of a climb. Um, so it really is kind of more site dependent, looking at the grading, and um, it it certainly is a possibility from an engineering perspective. And Sean, I'm seeing we're losing some of the people that have their hands raised. Can we maybe shift to the um, people with hands raised so we get those uh, verbal questions out on the table? Absolutely. So we've got, uh, as the next person, uh, Isaac Bissell has their hand raised. Um, Isaac, please unmute. We are ready for your question. Great. Um, so this is about climate change again. And I just wanted to say humanity really is in a truly desperate situation when it comes to climate change. And in the last few years, the picture that scientists have been painting is dramatically worsened. And it's gonna take something pretty miraculous for us to overcome the challenges that we face. And this will require out of the box thinking. Yet what I'm hearing here is that we're studying how to best double down on the status quo through a focus on I-89 and vehicle traffic. It's frustrating to hear when the insufficiency of these plans are pointed out by questioners that the, the question gets turned back on that person raising the issue as if any one person has all the answers to the problems of this magnitude. Um, you know, we're planning for a future that cannot come to fruition. You're, you mentioned something like a 2% reduction in vehicle traffic and a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas gas goals if we meet these, state, uh, these targets. Um, these types of targets, just like the targets in the Global Warming Solutions Act, are deeply insufficient. And if this is the best we can do as a society on a wide scale, then the results will be truly catastrophic. The idea that electric vehicles are the solution is a green growth fantasy, completely out of touch with our carbon budget and a real realistic view of the problem we face. The plan we are trying to implement is the attempt to decouple economic growth from emissions growth. And it is deeply delusional when you consider the latest studies on the pace of climate change and our dwindling emissions budget. I am a relatively young person and when I listen to this type of discussion and envision the future, I see the abundant life on this planet slipping through our fingers and it is deeply depressing. I feel like we're being failed by, by our political leaders who are unwilling to address the true scale of the problem. We cannot simply continue to give lip surface to climate change while planning for a future that is completely incompatible with addressing it. Uh, we shouldn't spend any more money on this study and I don't have a question. Thank you, Isaac. Um, and yeah, I do. Um, I'm sorry if you felt like I was turning the question back uh, on the, uh, the commenters, but uh, we we have spent quite a bit of time looking at investments to get to a more non-auto oriented future. Um, they do look insufficient. So I'm, I'm genuinely asking for more suggestions and, and ideas from other parts of the world um, of things that might work here. Um, we're not the biggest urban area in the world, uh, so we, you know, we don't have high-speed transit, we don't have that kind of density, but um, what kinds of things can we do, um, and what do you think would, would work better here? So, uh, we're open, thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, question or comment is going to be from Laura Jacoby. Laura, please unmute your mic, we're ready for your question. Hi, hi, thanks. Um, I'm uh, Laura from, um, I'm from Old Spokes Home. Um, hi, Charlie. Um, uh, yeah, so Mike, so our Old Spokes Home, a lot of our customers um, rely on their bicycles for transportation. And um, I guess my question is in terms of, um, uh, well, I guess my comment is, is, is to echo everyone else who says, I mean, it would be wonderful if we could build for the future that we want and not, not prop up a system that we know doesn't work for everyone, a transportation system that doesn't work for everyone. I mean, in terms of um, emissions, but also um, equity. And so when we look at economic, the economic, you know, the scoring and, and I see, you know, access to jobs as being part of the criteria. And again, I would just kind of ask, you know, jobs for whom, because we know that there is um, a large segment of our population that it, there's no way they could get themselves to the, you know, 
right um, to that area. We know um, I talk with employers now out on Heinsberg Road who literally can't fill positions because people cannot get there. People that mm. that can af you know can afford the kind of transportation that can be purchased on those wages just can't get there. And so because the buses don't go on this, you know, the late shifts, um, also the buses don't go all the way out there. So again, you know, I don't know who they're looking at in terms of access to jobs, but, um, you know, if we want to build a more equitable future, um, we should be putting our resources into helping people, um, you know, everybody get, get to jobs, not just people who can afford an individual motor vehicle, whether it be gasoline powered or electric. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Our next question or comment is going to come from uh, Jack Hansen. Uh, Jack, please unmute your mic. We're ready for your question. Great, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to speak and weigh in. Um, just one note process-wise, I think just given the hour and folks trying to speak, I, you know, I would ask maybe that you all just give everyone who hasn't spoken the opportunity before sort of offering responses or, or going back to people for second or third um, round. Just to, not that I don't appreciate the responses I do, but just because folks have taken the time out of their evening to try to weigh in, just trying to get everyone. Um, okay. Jack, that's why I wanted to go to the people that wanted to speak, so thank you. Great, great. Um, so just a question and then some comments. So my question is, what, what does each plan overall do to vehicle miles traveled, um, each proposal? Dave, do you remember the scoring or the metric on that? Yeah, it's you know less than two percent either way. So uh, across the county, looking at total VMT countywide, there's some that go up up one or two percent, some that go down one or two percent, but it doesn't move all that much with these new interchanges. Okay, okay. So that two point four percent figure that was related to this study. I wasn't sure if that was a broader sort of goal or no. That was, that was related to our metropolitan transportation plan that did not oh. include. Um, okay. But but this this these particular changes also kind of fall within that that scope. Uh, I guess maybe yeah, and and you know I think that's why I was trying to say you know the the interchanges themselves were not are not the purpose of this study. The purpose is to try to figure out how to reduce traffic on eighty nine. Uh, so I feel like there's a little bit of commentary uh, that is mischaracterizing purpose here a little bit. Um, you know. We're, uh, I think we have a shared agenda. So anyway, continue. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, I echo really a lot of the other comments and I really appreciate folks for, for weighing in on this, but we are in a climate emergency and transportation is the biggest sector that needs to transform and, and rapidly and it needs to look a lot different from how it, how it does today. Um, and really we just, we need much deeper reductions in VMT than 2% or 2.4%. So I just think spending all this money on these plans kind of within that framework, within a framework that really is just sort of tinkering around the edges versus to Richard Watt's point at the beginning, like what if we spent $900,000 studying how to reduce VMT as much as possible and how to this, no. this this is that project. Like weigh in on how to get there. Okay, I I don't feel like this is that project. I would love it to be, and that I guess is my feedback. I want to see us yeah. using these resources to answer the question of not how do we um, reduce you know traffic congestion or shorten the time that people have to wait getting on and off the intersection. I want to answer the question of how do we cut down emissions and how do we get people out of cars and how do we make it safer, more accessible, more affordable for people to um, walk, bike, and use public transportation. And I certainly have plenty of ideas because I have you know worked in the field for a while in terms of transportation demand management and boosting public transit. And I'm happy to share those, but I guess my broader point is that we should use 
um, the expertise and the, the money and resources we have to answer that question, you know, and you're going to be able to come up with better answers than I could just based on my limited time and expertise. But devoting those resources towards that question, it would be my biggest recommendation. That, that is the next step. And, and really, what, when you heard me, and maybe I'm, I apologize for not communicating more effectively, but, you know, the bundle, particularly bundle one, is really trying to get at that. Can we get to a future where we don't need to invest more in driving? That, that is the question. Okay, well, I, I think we just need to raise the bar then and, and shoot for a much deeper reduction in VMT than 2%. And that was really... not a goal. That was not a goal. That was just an outcome of, you know, one set of investments. So okay. I think the question is, yeah, what, what kind of investments, and I'm, again, I apologize for being so inarticulate in how we're asking this, but we really are looking for more ideas about how to change, how to get to that future. Um, so any ideas that you have or, or think we should explore, please let us know. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, keeping fare free transit going. I think expanding transit service um, and access and frequency, having dedicated lanes for high occupancy vehicles and transit, um, having shelters at all the bus stops, having really strong bicycle infrastructure like they do in the Netherlands or in Denmark that where people can get anywhere in the county safely by bike, regardless of their skill level. Um, you know, transportation where folks can walk safely to where they need to go and there's, there's strong pedestrian infrastructure and low speed limits. I mean, in yeah. continuing to invest in rail and trying to build out rail infrastructure, those are some of the ideas. And I just want to see you all, I think, um, putting out those proposals before us as more of the focus versus what we're mostly seeing tonight in the presentation was around um, some of these interchanges, but didn't really seem to look big picture at some of the ideas that I just um, threw out there. Understood. I appreciate it and sorry to take up a lot of time. I, I know there's other folks looking to get in. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. And, and I, yeah, I'll, I'll apologize too because the interchange, I think, has been the interchange conversation has been a big tangent, but is not the purpose of the project. So, uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you, Jack. I look forward to getting hearing more from you. And, um, Sean, let's move on to the next uh, person with a question. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Sophie Aronson, uh, please unmute your mic. We're ready for your question. Hi, um, I'd like to thank you all for facilitating this meeting and opening the space here. But um, yeah, I'm mostly reiterating what Richard, Tony, Marcy, Laura, Sarah, Isaac, and Jack have said. Um, I think like to say that we're trying to be forward thinking means that we need to be focusing on moving towards sustainable um, public transportation that's like accessible to um, all people and is not car centric. Um, I feel very strongly um, against the construction of exit B12. I think it would be such a shame to put so many resources into something that's not serving the people and isn't um, going to be um, propelling us towards like better positions um, regarding the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, I, I just think those resources could be utilized so much better um, $29 million could do so much more if it was put into making more comprehensive um, bus routes and, you know, having the um, bus seats be electric. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that and say that I'm feeling more supportive of um, Bundle 1. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Sophie. 
Um, I've got uh, Steve Crowley next. Hi, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't, I don't know what I really have to add. I, I put a few questions, specific questions in the, in the written questions, but really, uh, you know, people have been asking some great questions and, and I want to support that. And, and uh, maybe I would ask, you know, why build for the past instead of the future? And it really comes down to that. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're going to move over to written questions and get questions from those that we haven't heard from yet. Um, oh, uh, can we hear from Roseanne? Yeah, uh, Roseanne, uh, you can unmute now. We're ready for your question. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, thank you um, for listening to me. And I'm not going to repeat what everyone else said. Uh, you can hear me, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I don't know if you're keeping a tally of what you're hearing, and I've posted a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, in, in the Q and A's. But I just want to echo the things you have heard from Richard and Marcy and Isaac, which was just uh, out of this world a statement, and Sarah and Sophie and and Jack. I I can't strongly um, express um, my feelings uh, about that th we're in a different world. And if we are ever to survive, we got to dramatically change the way we think first. Um, you say, Charlie, that this is about you know over you know looking at the planning in general, but but your whole presentation is about concrete and exchanges um, and car traffic. So I came away with that's what your focus is. It's all about cars and and what we do to the uh, interstate to make make it easier for cars and and you know you, you're well aware of uh, what happens when you expand roadways and add more exchanges you just get more cars um for the record i'm totally against exit 12b but i'm also against doing anything for the other exits too before we look at other ways of moving people that don't take fossil fuels exit 12b and anything else is going to take massive amounts of fossil fuel to construct it'll destroy um, natural environments, um, so it'll be counterproductive. It's going to add more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's going to take away the natural resources that we have to absorb carbon dioxide. So it's a double whammy. You you talk about the economics, but you're talking you're looking at apparently the the economic benefits, not the economic costs to doing something. And there's always an economic cost in the environment. Um, you know costs also our economic costs. One last thing, about 10 or 11 years ago, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission brought this idea of 12B to us. And what we haven't talked about here um, is what happens when the cars get off the road. At that discussion 10 years ago, it was to get the cars to the airport. And that meant driving right through residential neighborhoods in South Burlington. If you're going to put an exchange in, which I hope you don't, in fact, I hope you don't spend a penny more on, it, on planning for, for the interstate. I think any money you have should be devoted to how do we do things like what Jack was suggesting. You know, let's make it easy and safe for people to use bikes. But this exchange will destroy huge parts of South Burlington because the traffic will zoom through them, just like they zoom through Williston Road to get to wherever they're going or going to Burlington. So long-winded, add my name and number to those who say, put the environment first, we're in a crisis, let's act like we're in a crisis. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Rosanna, appreciate it. So, good, uh, so thanks, Sean. I think we got through everybody that had their hand raised. And, yes. Um, I'm seeing that there's like 60 questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, which um, I think we'll uh, have to just digest and uh, and work on uh, responses and make sure we're considering all them. Um, I don't even know how to consider them. Uh, so we, Sean, do you have a better suggestion or date? So I, I can pull a report and have a record of these questions. Okay. Yeah, so um, so I guess just seeing that it's a few minutes uh, before nine, and uh, we kind of said we promised we would do the seven to nine. 
Um, I really want to express my, my sincere appreciation for everybody that took the time out of your personal time to uh, contribute to this conversation. Um, and uh, I, I hope um, you uh, feel that uh, we were listening and that, um, that these are important issues. I think we are talking about what is the future of our community. Um, and it is up to all of us. Um, it's not up to me. Uh, it, you know, even as my role of Kidney County Regional Planning Commission Director, um, for better or worse, I don't tell people what to do here. <laughs> we, we, uh, you know, we try to make good investments uh, in policy, like the zoning bylaw, or or work with VTRANS and municipalities on good investments in transportation infrastructure and GMT uh, and local motion and uh, car share. All those uh, people who are uh, trying to move the ball here. Um, I guess I was, you know, I'm listening to it, and I'm I'm struck by the challenge that we have, um, and that we try to make a lot uh, in our planning, in our MTP, a lot of investments in transit and biking and walking, and it is it is disappointing to see uh, you know, for at least our estimates were only like two percent of vehicle miles travel reduction. Um, so it just kind of points out to me that collectively as a community and as a society, we have a ton to do to change the trajectory we're on. Um, and uh, so uh, I hope you see us as a willing partner in that work. Um, and um, But it's also kind of like eating an elephant. We got to just keep chewing. Uh, so we'll keep taking bites out of that and uh, work towards that. Um, so I will uh, end with thank you and, and thank you for your patience, all of you that stuck with us to the end. Um, and uh, stay tuned for more. Um, we appreciate it. And if, any more comments you have, please get them to us by May 7th. Um, thank you very much. And everybody have a good night. Thank you.